morning friends professor g s madala passed away on june 4 1999 at columbus ohio united states he was 66 we are dedicating today's proceedings of this prestigious conference in honor and memory of him late professor madala was a leading and influential figure in the econometrics profession for more than three decades he was a BA in Mathematics from the Andhra University in 1955, MA in Statistics from the Bombay University in 1957, and a PhD in Economics from the University of Chicago in 1963. He served prestigious universities in the United States such as Stanford, Rochester, Cornell, Florida, etc. And at the time of his demise, he was holding the University Eminent Scholar Professorship in the Department of Economics at the Ohio State University. He also held visiting positions at various other prestigious places such as Yale, Core, Monash, etc. <coughs> he bore editorial responsibilities of prominent journals of international repute such as Econometric Theory, Journal of Statistical Planning and Inference, Econometrica, Journal of Applied Econometrics, etc. He guided more than 50 doctoral students he always maintained that he learned a lot working along with his students. Apparently, he didn't believe in frontier production functions. He always opposed that uh, concept. <coughs> he also wrote articles using Bayesian analysis. In a recent interview, he said, I think the controversy between Bayesian and the classical econometricians is largely unnecessary. Even econometricians of the classical persuasion can learn a lot from the Bayesian approach. I am not a diehard Bayesian saying that that is the truth and the whole truth, but still I always like to think about the Bayesian solution to each econometric problem. Professor Madala did not believe in empty theorizing and in highly, improvising, impo highly imposing mathematical models. <coughs> he advised students to work on real world problems of practical interest. Thus, his own empirical work consisted of very diverse areas such as consumption functions, cost and production functions, money demand, regulation, pseudo data, returns to education, market discrimination, survey data, discipline in future markets, etc. He was a Fulbright scholar and a fellow of the Econometric Society. His 1983 Econometric Society monograph on limited dependent and qualitative variables in econometrics was declared as a citation classic by current contents. Social, cita Social Science Citation Index has rated him as one of the top five most cited econometricians during each of the years 1988-94. Incidentally, I also read somewhere that he wanted to do his PhD under the guidance of Professor C. R. Rao. And when he went to ISI, with that intention, he had Professor Vardhan and Pro Professor Vardhan and Professor K. R. Padsar they talking to each other in a very high sounding mathematical and statistical techniques and he got scared and he said no I better not join here and he went away to <laughs> that's what he says at some place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and also there is another thing which is to be noted that uh, sometimes things that go in India wrong perhaps help the profession in the sense that after he finished his PhD, he actually wanted to come back for a already assured position of professorship at Bombay University, but these people did not wait that long, that is until he returned. So meanwhile these people finished it. So he didn't have a job in India. Therefore, he continued to stay in, in U.S. That's another <laughs> that's a, a thing. And another thing to be noted in his thing is that he is slightly, maybe not slightly, my word is wrong. He's highly philosophical, it seems, in his life and quite very simple-minded. And uh, he, say, he said that he lost a lot of thinking and spirituality because he couldn't return to India and he felt bad about that. That's another interesting story. <coughs> he died on June 4, 
His demise brought an irreplaceable loss to the scientific community all over the world, in particular to economists and other social scientists, econometricians and statisticians. Let all of us pay our respects and regard to late Professor G.S. Madala by, by observing a minute of solemn silence in his honor and memory and for his peace. Professor Madala. I, I only met him once and um, it was quite by accident. He was sitting next to me on a plane from um, Barcelona to Madrid after the 1990 um, World Congress and uh, we discussed textbooks. <laughs> um, my talks are going to be on um, basically Bayesian methodology for estimating the Gini coefficient as a measure of income inequality. Um, and it can be divided into three sort of different ways of doing it. The, the first two, um, well the fir first two will be in the first talk and the second one in the, uh, the third one rather in the second talk. The, the first one is a, making a particular assumption, probability distribution assumption about the income distribution. The second one is estimating when the Lorenz curve is assumed to be approximated by linear segments. And then the third one is when you estimate a continuous Lorenz function. Now this is, um, the, the two papers for this uh, that the, this talk's based on are in the, um, uh, the, the booklet that you're given at the beginning. Um, this is joint work with Blancamon Dr. Kapanich. So think of ordering the population from the, the poorest person to the richest person and then measuring the cumulative proportion of population you get by adding up and cumulating the population uh, and measuring against that the cumulative proportion of income um, adding from the poorest person up to the richest person in terms of income and the function that describes that is called a Lorenz function pi is going to be the cum cumulative proportion of uh, population Eta is going to be the cumulative proportion of income and typically the Lorenz function looks like this when it's graphed on a unit square uh, it's, it's below a 45 degree line like that and the Gini coefficient is defined as twice that area in there or in other words um, if, if, if there's total equality of income then it will lie on this 45 degree line and the value will be zero. Um, if it's um, uh, this total inequality, everybody, one person has all the income, then uh, it will correspond to the, those axes and will be equal to one. So small values represent more equality than, than large values and it's a, on a zero one scale. So this area in terms of a continuous Lorenz function is defined as, as that integral and if you have group data and you um, assume the Lorenz curve is approximated by <coughs> linear segments on that group data then you can prove that the area uh, by constructing triangles and so on you can prove that the area can be re represented by that discrete formula. Uh, what is group data? The, for group data we have a number of income classes and we know the number of households or we collect information on the number of households within each income class. Uh, this is tie data collected by or, or obtained anyway by my co-author 
um, and these are barred. So um, in terms of um, uh, in terms of Australian currency anyway, uh, a baht's about the same as a rupee. Um, now, these relationships will prove to be useful later if P is the uh, proportion of population in a, um, a particular class, so pi is the cumulative proportion, so it's just the sum of these P's up to a particular class. Um, so that will prove to be useful later. And this one will be proved to be useful later also. Um, if mu is the average income within the jth class, then the uh, cumulative proportion of income is, uh, you, to get the cumulative proportion of income, we've got total income in the denominator, and we've got the sum of the proportion of population uh, times the uh, mean income for that class. And what, what we're basically going to do here is to, well, it depends on our approach, but we're going to get a posterior distribution for either P, the proportion of population in each income class, or we're going to get a posterior distribution for parameters upon which that depends. And then we're going to also look at different ways we can handle uh, not knowing what this mu j is. And so what we'll be doing is getting subjective distributions of some kind on this P and this mu, and then translating those into subjective distributions on pi and eta, and hence a, dis a posterior distribution for the Gini coefficient. Um, that's what I was trying to say, I guess, before I put this up, um, that we'll, uh, we'll be looking at uncertainty in P uh, through sampling error and uncertainty in mu because we don't know uh, where within each class the mean income of that class necessarily is. Well, let's, let's look at the likelihood function. Uh, this is a multinomial likelihood function. So this assumes uh, random sampling from the population. Uh, P is the proportion of population in each class. And N, or PI, is the proportion of population in the I class. And NI is um, the number uh, sampled from that particular class. And the way we're going to approach that depends on um, I don't know if that's entirely accurate. Posterior PDF P for P depends on the approach chosen for mu, but certainly the posterior PDF for the, the Gini coefficient will depend on that. And we're going to consider two approaches. Um, the first one is to assume a particular income distribution and we look at two. We look at um, uh, the log normal distribution. And the second one we look at, which is fitting on today, I suppose, is what's called the Singh Madala income distribution. Um, if we assume income is log normal, then you can prove that the Gini coefficient is given by this expression. So, um, with the uh, capital phi here is the CDF for the standard normal distribution. And notice this just depends on sigma for this particular income distribution. So, um, so really all we need to do is to try and estimate sigma and we've got the Gini coefficient as a function of sigma. How do we do that? Well, we can use Bayes' theorem here. Um, we need a, 
a prior for um, Mu and Sigma, and we need a um, the likelihood. For the prior, we just chose a non-informative, typical non-informative prior. For the likelihood, we use the multinomial likelihood, but we substitute in what the expressions are for the PI when you have a log normal distribution. So when you have a log normal distribution, this is the probability of getting an observation from the ith class. So we can just substitute that into the P's. Um, so that ends up giving us this posterior PDF, which I guess is a fairly nasty kind of one in the sense that you certainly um, don't know what sort of distribution this is when you're in terms of mu and sigma um, but in terms of modern day um, Markov chain Monte Carlo um, or even given that this has only got two parameters we could presumably do a numerical integration on this um, the, there isn't any problem in, in proceeding um, to do things that I was talking about yesterday, get graphs um, of the post marginal posterior PDFs for mu and sigma, and, and get also their moments, things like the mean and standard deviation. Now, of course, we're not interested in them themselves. We're interested in the Gini coefficient, which is a nonlinear function of sigma, but we can still proceed and get that too. And I'll show you how we did that soon. But first of all, let's let's look at the um, sigma dollar income distribution first. We do the same thing here, except that um, we have a different CDF. So um, this is the uh, there's a closed form expression for the um, uh, CDF of the income dollar income distribution, and so we can again substitute that into the multinomial uh, likelihood function and then it becomes a function of uh, uh, in this case theta the parameter vector theta uh, is consists of um, a b and q um, the uh, there's a question of what prior to use here um, i didn't do a lot of deep thinking about this I simply made them all uniform except for B, which is the scale parameter. Um, and uh, uh, so I took um, 1 over B as my prior distribution on theta. Uh, there's also some inequality constraints, which I've forgotten to, to I've overlooked putting in here and which I forget. Um, but presumably they'll be in that, in that paper. Um, but, but so um, I talked about inequality constraints yesterday. Uh, this is not defined over um, the complete real line for these parameters. There, there are inequality constraints. And uh, the, the Gini coefficient, uh, it can be shown is, is this function of, of the gamma function. So again, we're interested in quite a nonlinear function of these A, B and Q uh, for our posterior PDF. Um, now to, to draw from those posterior PDFs we used a random walk metropolis algorithm, the same kind of algorithm I talked about, I keep saying yesterday, but yesterday I was in Mysore being a tourist and um, this was um, uh, Tuesday, I guess. I, no, Monday I talked, wasn't I? Yeah. So um, I won't leave that up there too long. Uh, that's in the paper. That's the same um, uh, sort of algorithm as, um, uh, as I talked about before. And you might even notice that some of the words are the same. I just stole it. So, um, but I, I should summarize what we're doing. So, so what we can do is we can use this technique to 
draw observations from the posterior for, in the case of the log normal on mu and sigma, and then from sigma we can compute a whole lot of draws on the Gini coefficient, and we got thousands of them. Computing's cheap, so we, I forget how many exactly, but probably 80,000 or something. And um, uh, and then same for the sigma dollar. Um, we draw observations on A, B, and Q. For every observation on A, B, and Q, we compute a value for the Gini coefficient using all those gamma functions. We have observations on the Gini coefficient. This other approach is, I think, slightly novel, and I, I must say I have had some trouble convincing uh, people about that because they seem to get a bit confused about what I'm doing. Um, so if, um, if you think this is kind of funny, you're not alone. Um, first of all, I don't want to make an income distribution assumption about at all. And I want to go back to those discrete formulas for, um, for, for um, pi and eta. Back to hit these. And the idea here is I, I can use my multinomial likelihood to get a posterior PDF on the Bs. Then if I can put in some kind of information about the mu's independently, then I can get posterior PDFs on pi and eta and hence on the Gini coefficient using that discrete formula. So that's what I set out to do. And, and so here's the, um, um, here's the first one, is the posterior PDF on the, on the P's. Um, this, for the multinomial distribution, there's a, um, there's several sort of non-informative priors that have been suggested. This is one of them. And when you view this then as a function of P rather than uh, N, this is what's called a, a Dirichlet distribution, which um, features heavily in my, in my next talk too. So that's the posterior for P. We can, we can draw readily from this Dir Dirichlet distribution um, using uh, gamma distributions. Now, um, for mu j, I considered three possibilities. I've only got two listed here, but there's actually a third as well. And the first one is to assume that the income, um, the, the mean income within each class is just the midpoint of that class. And that we know that with certainty. So there's no uncertainty about that. We know that that's what the mean point is. And that's what most people do. Well, most people have done when they do these studies from a sampling theory point of view, that's what they do. Then I said, well, let's, let's put a subjective PDF, just a, a total prior, um, use what information we can from talking to people um, about where in the interval mu j might lie. And I came up with this triangular distribution um, which it lies between the lower class limit and the upper class limit with a mode set somewhere, somewhere, uh, and this CJ is, is the mode. Now where, where people um, seem to get confused here is that they seem to think this was the distribution of income within the class. And it's not. It's a subjective distribution on where within the class the mean income of that class lies. Um, now, the question is, how do you set these CJs? Well, if you have some idea of where the modal income is, then and you're on the increasing part of the, the income distribution, then you would expect this CJ to be closer to the upper class limit because incomes are increasing. If you're going down, you would expect it to be closer to the lower class limit. And how close would be 
depend on how rapidly you're going up and how rapidly you're going down. And, and so we made some assumptions about that. Now they are subjective assumptions and immediately of course what everyone wants to do is say how do you, how do you set that? Um, but my response to that question is this is just the mode we're setting. We're still getting lots of values away from that mode in this subjective distribution as well. Um, okay, so I think that... Uh, but we had to make some judgment about where the, um, where the mode was and we assumed I think that was um, 2,000 or 4,000 baht. Uh, Four thousand baht, I think. And uh, what else have I got here? Okay, so then when we do that, draws of the mu j and p j are used to calculate draws of the pi's and eta's, and through the discrete formula, the, the Jenny. So here, here are my, here are, uh, are my prior modes. Four thousand was assumed to be the mode. This one's closer. You assume that income rises very rapidly initially, so this this um, eighteen hundred is closer to two thousand than this three thousand seven hundred is to four thousand. Then you reach the top and you come down and you come down quickly at first and then level off, and and these are meant to reflect that. So these are closer to the lower points here, and then uh, and and for the for the last interval, of course, you've. You, you, you can't put your endpoint in a triangular distribution at infinity, so you've got to make you've got to assume that there's a, a point beyond which uh, you don't think average income in that upper class could possibly be. And I think we assume sixty thousand baht or something like that. Um, and and the other one. Now, as it turns out in the results, this tends to be pretty vague information. And I think it's because the triangular distribution really has quite fat tails around the end points. And, um, and, and, and as you'll see, the posterior you get using this subjective PDF is quite diffuse. I mean, or quite spread out anyway, not maybe diffuse as overstating it. Um, and so we decided to go with another distribution at where the tails weren't quite so fat because maybe, you know, probably mean income has not really got that much probability of being right at the class boundary. And the other one we chose was the beta distribution. Um, and this is how we we generated our um, observations from the beta distribution. The beta distribution, of course, is defined over 0, 1. We had to change the limits to, to uh, from Zj to Zj plus 1. This is basically how you do it. It's just mechanical details, really. Um, we set um, the, the sum of the parameters of the beta distribution determines how spread out it is. Uh, we just chose 10, which is uh, not too, uh, well, reasonably spread out, but, you know, not too much. It's a, a subjective decision. And, and then this is the mode, this value is the mode, and so um, uh, we set this equal to mo the mode. You've got to make this adjustment because it's not between 0 and 1. Uh, so this is sort of converting C to the mode that lies between 0 and 1. So let's just summarise all that then. We, um, we draw P from this Dirichlet distribution, we draw mu from our subjective distribution, whether it's a triangular or a beta, we compute uh, pi and eta, and then we compute the Gini coefficient. And we do that for lots of values. That gives us um, five, 
five sets of results, the log normal income distribution, the sigma dollar income distribution, uh, the one where we assume the mu j's are the midpoints with certainty, um, the triangular prior and the beta prior. What do they look like? Well, um, first of all, the, uh, look at the two here, ones where you put a particular income distribution assumption on it. Uh, well, no, this one that puts a particular income distribution assumption. This is the log normal. And this one is when you assume the mean incomes of the midpoints with certainty. Notice these things are about the same dispersion, although they're located quite differently. And um, you, can, you can explain the fact, I think, that they're about the same dispersion because when you make an income distribution assumption, you're really determining pretty well exactly where the, mid, where the mean income for each class is. That is a function of the particular income distribution you use. So in a way, it's not really surprising that they have similar dispersion. It's a little bit worried that they're located quite differently. And I think the, um, the question you'd want to ask is, does the log normal distribution fit income very well? And if you check that out, the answer's uh, pretty well no. Um, if you do a chi-squared um, goodness of fit type test, if you can sort of be classical for a minute, um, then, or frequent us for a minute, uh, then um, you, it, it, doesn't, it does reject the log normal um, income distribution. Now the second thing is that this um, one where you assume the prior means follow a triangular distribution has enormous spread compared to the other two. It says you know very little about this Gini coefficient. And um, uh, so much so that um, uh, when my co-author gave this at a conference in, um, uh, at ANU, Neil Shepard, who was a uh, prominent Bayesian from um, Oxford, insisted that there had to be a computing error. And, um, but we've checked our computing thoroughly, and, and I think it's right. And I think it's a consequence of those those fat tails. So we did a bit more, um, um, I've got some, no, I'll put that up a bit later, probably, maybe. So we did a bit more, and we've got some more distributions added to that now. And the the consequence of the, these are, the sigma dollar income distribution is this one, so it's located even further to the right. So it, it gives you a quite different fit and, and an acceptable fit um, as distinct from the log normal. However, it's a three parameter income distribution. So with that additional parameter, you don't estimate things um, quite as accurately, I feel. And and so the the um, the Gini the, the posterior PDF for the Gini coefficient is a bit more spread out. Now I haven't I haven't done that, but that's that's a, a possibility, and particularly in the next um, in the in the um, in the next paper, um, I think is um, now the, the beaker. It didn't really, you know, didn't really achieve what we hoped it might. So maybe I had a beta that was perhaps, I mean, your, your subjective information is your subjective information, I suppose, and you, you can't, um, uh, you, just because you don't like the results, you can't say my subjective information is not right. But I suspect the one we, we put on was still fairly flat, the prior, because it did not really change this triangular one all that much. I mean, it moved it over a bit, 
and um, it it um, reduced the dispersion but um, as you can see it's still pretty flat but what I think what it does show particularly too it does show um, in a sense how critical this assumption about knowing where the uh, that the, the midpoint of income is um, uh, is equal to mean income with certainty it does show you um, how critical that assumption is in terms of your quantity of information about the Gini coefficient. Um, here are some posterior means and standard deviations. Um, I don't think they, I think pictures give you more information than these, but uh, there they are for what they're worth. Uh, the, the first two, the midpoints and the log normal, you can see the location's quite different but the uh, standard deviations are not all that different. The triangular one has the biggest, quite large, uh, biggest standard deviation, I mean. Uh, the beta is a little bit smaller than that, but again, quite large. And sigma dollar is sort of in between in terms of, of that. So, um, um, I've sort of talked to that as I've gone, so I've probably, let me just put these up, but I've probably said a lot of these things. Um, ah, okay, so I've actually, we plotted the, uh, we plotted some Lorenz curves uh, one using the midpoints, uh, and these are using posterior means. Um, one using the midpoints, one using the modes, and one using the log normal. And um, this is this is what what you get. And so you can see that the the log normal one is is quite different, um, but. There's no reflection of dispersion here, of course, because these are just using posterior means. But, but it, it, what was um, perhaps a bit unexpected, but maybe reassuring, is that if you assume you know the midpoints with certainty, um, know that mean incomes are equal to the midpoints with certainty, and you use these prior modes and have a triangular distribution, uh, then on average your Lorenz curves don't look all that different. And the, the, the Gini coefficient estimates presumably weren't all that different either. Let me have a look. So that would be, um, yeah, these two here. Yeah, I've already said that. Um, assuming a particular income distribution and um, fixing the the mean incomes provide about the same amount of information. Uh, another observation, another reason I think is that that, that perhaps these using these priors on the mu j. Um, gives uh, ends up with a posterior that's quite spread out is is that we were drawing these mu j's from each class independently and that's probably not very realistic if you've got two adjacent classes and you happen to draw a mu j that's very low for one class and very high for another class then that's probably not very realistic so um, in hindsight although I didn't think about it when we did it um, it, it may not be, um, it, we may be better off having a, some sort of joint distribution um, where the mu j's are not independent. And that might ex help explain to the, the, the spread. Um, Pretty much said that I think so. Um, uh, that that 
it does illustrate that the results you get, particularly about the um, uh, the level of information, can be quite um, uh, quite sensitive, quite sensitive to the, your assumptions. What sort of income distribution were the prior user? Uh, here's one I haven't said, I guess, and that it seems to me that if you use this second approach where you put a prior on the the mean class incomes then then you have an approach that's fairly robust in terms of whatever income distribution you, you might have but that robustness does come at some cost and that cost is a much greater spread in terms of what you actually know um, about where that um, uh, Gini coefficient could be. So, so if we could get a little bit more information or if we could be a bit more certain about mu j, we can improve what we know quite a bit. Well, that's, um, that's quite a short paper. That's the, uh, that's the end of the first one. Um, I, the next one could be a little bit long, so I might actually start that before um, this hour is up.